Today, we're lucky to be joined by three talented young videographers. Mike Gray, Alice Greenfield, and Keenan Lamb. They'll share their experiences and creative workflows, and also their editing secrets in the color grading process. We'll also be discussing the future of filmmaking and how the craft is rapidly evolving. After the talk, Mike Gray will run through his own color grading process on our monitor over here, sharing his ex expertise to help you improve the color in your video output. We'll then hold a short Q&A session before breaking out into networking where canapes and drinks will be served. So thank you very much, guys, for joining us today um, and being with us. Um, you've all traveled from different parts. Mike's come down from Manchester, Alice from the Isle of Wight, and Keenan from Bromley. London? Yeah. Bromley, from here, thank you. So there we go. Um, but yeah, so before we get started um, and into all the, all the details, just going to introduce um, each of our um, videographers, filmmakers today. Um, so yeah, guys, just keen to know your story, you know, how you started out, a little bit about you um, and some projects you've worked on. Yeah. Hi guys, uh, my name is Michael Gray. I'm a 25 year old filmmaker. I specialize in doing a lot of travel and lifestyle content. Um, so I started my journey around seven years ago. Um, well, actually, when I was a kid, um, about 11 years old, that's when I first picked up a camera. And to be honest, it goes back to when I was just running around in an, an abandoned quarry with my mates, just shooting all sorts. We used to make these stupid like, action films with fake guns. And then I'll go back into After Effects and like, do all the, the explosions and muzzle flashes. Um, and that just really kind of ignited that passion for filmmaking. So um, I just dived right into it, learned all the softwares from Adobe and just got better and better from there. So it's, I'm really fortunate to travel the world um, and meet amazing people along the way. And um, yeah, I've worked with brands such as like obviously ViewSonic, Sony, Canon, um, DJI for their drone campaigns. And um, yeah, it's been a, a wild ride, but yeah, I'm really grateful for, the, for what I get to do every, every day. And it's, uh, yeah, it's awesome to, to keep kind of just finding like-minded people and connect with them and create awesome projects for them. So, no, yeah, thanks for being so. with us today as well, Mike. Uh, Alice. Hi, so yeah, my name is Alice Greenfield and uh, I'm from the Isle of Wight, which is a very small island down on the south coast and that's where I've travelled up today. It's actually quite interesting coming back to London because I used to live here and uh, I'm a nature buff, so being in the city is kind of uh, different, but here I am. Uh, so I actually, unlike Mike, studied film and photography, so my roots um, kind of came from first having a camera when I was a kid and loving it to wanting to pursue it. And I started that kind of journey at A-level and then I went to uh, university kind of in a time where it was much more stereotypical to specialise in a certain area of film production. So I studied at the Leeds, Leeds University and I did cinematography. And that was a time where um, it was kind of important to learn one of those skills and then further go into the film industry. And I didn't really understand or know too much about online content or short content uh, and the idea that I could pretty much make money from uh, working not in a big film production kind of area. So I left uni and I kind of applied to every film school and I didn't get into anything and it was a very sad time. But it was okay because I had a portfolio that I was working on and um, uh, at the time I was really focused on just making projects as a passion for myself. So after feeling a little bit kind of uh, sad about not getting to film school, I found a job in London after applying for about six months. And that first job was lot, all about short form, six to second videos. And I don't know if you all remember a time like back, back in about 2015 and 16, but recipe videos were really big and Buzzfeed was around and everyone was making 30 second videos of just recipe videos. And I started out doing a lot of recipe and online short content, parenting content, uh, sometimes like kind of partner with bigger brands um, uh, in this like, production media outlet that I was working in. And I spent four years in London kind of hustling and working and making YouTube videos and all sorts. And at that point, I was also um, being a producer and dabbling in like all sorts of areas of the film industry. So I was first wanted to be in cinematography and then I kind of ended up doing a bit of every role of production. And that's obviously led myself to kind of being 
able to edit, produce, direct all my films now. So I kind of decided London was not for me um, and left the concrete jungle. Um, I actually got pushed out of the company a little bit by an old manager and I didn't really get along with her. So looking back, um, I'm kind of glad that there was a slight conflict because um, that really pushed me to start my freelance kind of life. And this is only back in 2019. So I chose to be a freelancer just before lockdown, which was like a fantastic decision, whatever. But I did go home, which home was the Isle of Wight. So London wouldn't have suited the kind of content I wanted to make. I needed to be near a beach because all I wanted to do was make content about nature. So I went home to where my parents live and I have not left. And there is where I've basically built my uh, kind of freelance career and my business. And I started my own production agency during lockdown when I didn't have anything to do. I built a website with my partner, Sam, and we decided to pretty much focus on creating video production, uh, photography services, aerials and like uh, marketing materials for any brand in the outdoor e sector. So if you know me or any of my work, e everything is to do with the ocean and sport and being outdoors. And I absolutely love uh, having my office there. So during this time, I started using Instagram as a tool to pretty much like be my main form of marketing and it's kind of paid off, which has kind of led me here to talk, to talk about all this, like Instagram is the one. And I just waffled so much, so. No, thank you. Thanks for making the trip, Alice, and we're glad you're in London tonight, even though, yeah. Um, hi guys, my name's Keenan. Um, I'm a 24-year-old uh, filmmaker and photographer from London. Um, I've been doing this professionally for about four years. Um, five, one year just hustling and doing like rubbish videos for clients and stuff. But it all started a very long time ago when I was like 12, 13, making like stop motion animation videos with like Lego characters that I built um, and animation, no, not animation tutorials, origami tutorials, um, teaching people how to make like a little shuriken knife. It got quite a few, fair few views, which was quite cool. Um, but that was kind of like my introduction into like editing content and posting it out on social media. Um, then obviously A-levels and stuff happened, um, coming from an Asian family, creative is, creativity and those industries is not like a thing that they want, being a lawyer and stuff. Um, so took a year out, went traveling with my cousin um, and then just made travel vlogs, just editing those, putting them on YouTube, like not hoping anything for it. And then a trip happened when I went to Iceland with two of my friends, Watch Luke and Sam Newton. Some of you guys might know those guys. Um, and I got a call from Specsavers to document uh, their glasses at London Fashion Week. So I flew back a few days earlier and uh, created a video for that. They really liked it. And just from then on, I realized I could actually start making money from creating video stuff. Realized that I had like a bit of a skill for it. Hustled for a few months trying to find jobs, doing things for like 50 quid, which is just not worth my time. Um, but you know, it kind of led me to all these, these parts and, and working with creators and stuff and actually Ultimately, being here and speaking in front of you guys, so it's been a it's been a wild ride, but it's um, it's been worth it. Yeah, thanks, Keenan. And it's clear like everyone here has come from very different backgrounds and experiences, um, but I think that's what will make the talk interesting today. Um, it's not all the same perspective and everything. So um, yeah, thanks for that, guys. So the first topic we're going to get into um, is why color is important in your work. Um, you know, this could be from how you use colour or how it makes your um, work unique compared to other videographers or uh, other filmmakers. Um, so yeah, Mike, do you, to, do you want to start us off? Yeah, I think for me, colours, one of the biggest things is creating a unique style. Every time I, I watch a piece of content, one of the first things I look for is, okay, how is this go uh, girl or guy um, coloured graded it? And it really kind of tells the audience what they want them to feel. So if it's like a moody shot, a dark kind of vibe, they obviously want to convey to the audience that those kind of feelings and it's all about emotion and color as well so i think yeah i think over time starting out like my color grading was so bad like it was like really saturated till till an orange for those who know like that was kind of a phase um and slowly and but surely like you just kind of develop your own style and after a lot of practicing you do just get better at color grading that's when you really do find your unique Styles so like, for example, when I watch something from Keenan's, I can automatically tell that it's okay. That's shot by Keenan and edited by Keenan because you have like a type of color grade, and like yeah, <laughs> and like my friend James, like he kind of creates a bit more of a moody, dark look, but that's that's his kind of style. So it's very much like um, a unique um, thing. I I think in terms of color grading, like everyone has a complete different style. So that's what uh, color grading is for me. 
Yeah, Alice, how about you? How's how's colour important in your work? I like totally agree what, yeah. with what Mike said. Like working out how to create a unique palette is part of the filmmaking process. Um, but also, as all of us work in the industry and we want to find clients, keep clients, and uh, like show off our unique perspective, like working out what colours we like. Obviously, I'm always in the ocean, so blue is like a big theme of my kind of thing. But I, I agree. Colour is completely emotive, the lack of it, um, using it in certain ways. Uh, if we look at any film, it's the, one of the biggest departments in terms of like set design, costume design, uh, what kind of camera and what kind of stock or kind of luck you use. So it's incredibly difficult to get right. And sometimes I think viewers overlook it, but that's where it's working. A bit like sound editing or even editing itself. If someone's not thinking too much about it, they're doing a good job. But I, I spent, I think colour for me is really important because a lot of my studying was actually all about colour. Like um, back at University of Leeds, I spent like hours watching films, our assignments, which it sounds like a dream, it was a dream, like we would go back uh, uh, to home and have a list of films to watch and um, we weren't just there to get some popcorn out and watch it, we actually had to make notes and um, think about the themes, um, whether that's to do with the story, the colour, the production, or the c even the camera movements, but I was always really interested in the colour science and I ended up doing an, an elective in colour science because of that, um, but, all, but mostly that particular course was quite scientific so I'm not sure I read the the tin quite right on that particular course but the lecturer did enable me to kind of write more about film and colour but um, I just really believe that you can transport your viewer into a film with using different colours and I used to make a lot of black and white films too because there's it's something different snaps in your brain when you're looking at something that's in black and white you see form or shape more than uh, what costume colour is or what the, the character's wearing or the set design. So it's a really interesting thing. And we're going to talk way more about that later. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think it's, it's one of the most important things. Um, we're all visual people as human beings. Yeah, I mean, you had that background as well, like you say, at university, but yeah. Keenan, I mean, you, you didn't study colour science at university? Or something? Nah, I didn't study anything, guys. I didn't go to university. Um, yeah, so I think colour is in itself, like, very, very important when it comes to, like, especially video editing and even photo editing. Um, you have, obviously, like, actual camera movement. You have the editing of the sound design, but colour in itself, to me, I believe, is, like, its own art, and it's also quite a hard thing to master. But one thing that makes it unique is the fact that it's very, very kind of, like, unique to you as a person. So if I'm creating stuff for myself that I push out to, you know, on Instagram or YouTube and stuff, um, having it like unique to me, have my own colors, the kind of things that I like, adds a whole like kind of my own perspective to it. Um, and also it's important for kind of your, your online portfolio. For example, if you post to Instagram or you post to like YouTube, you want to like maintain something that is kind of very unique to you. And that's why clients want to hire you because you have a style. And part of that style can come from the colour palette, the themes and stuff that you have. So, yeah, um, very important. Yeah, I mean, if you guys said you had two key colours in your palettes, what would they be off, off the top of your head? It, well, it used, it, used to be two, it used to be two and orange. But. Yeah, that is, that's a theme. Yeah, that yeah. was a theme. Yeah. But mine's too much. I've really dialed it back. I think less is more these days. Um, some people really do overdo it. Uh, obviously, it's personal preference, but I really like to just kind of keep it natural and, like, like, for example, if I'm shooting like in a woodland, the greens, I don't really want to just make them art too artificial. I want to keep it what it actually was. Because yeah. I, I think people just like relate to it, re relate to it more. Um, yeah. So yeah, less is more in my opinion. Yeah. How about you, Alice? Is it a lot of blues and greens then? With the it depends, like, because I work on so many bits of branded content for, for clients. Yeah. And every good, well, every, well, maybe not a good brand, but every brand has a colour scheme within their logo or within their uh, brand guidelines or just in their actual product, the colour of the product or whatever. So like a lot of the time when I'm working with clients, colour is really important. I don't have so much of a say, but there's so many ways that you can um, introduce like their colours into the colour scheme. But personally, when I get my own like personal projects underway, because I'm so close to a beach and water, it's always annoyingly blue and orange <laughs> but I generally do love that look um, but I do also enhance I know you said you keep things 
more natural, but there's a very like particular blue that I like, and that's something that I spread across my Instagram feed uh, when I, in my photography. Yeah, so and so, really kind of yeah, like a slight blue that's not, not it's not a teal, it's more like a, a deeper blue that um, the ocean in the Isle of Wight and in the UK is not the kind of blue that you would get in the Bahamas. Like it's Strange. muddy blue. <laughs> blue is different colours in the world and different places in the world. So Keenan, what, what would yours be? I mean, you've done a lot of travel lately. Uh, I have done a lot of travel lately. I've been very fortunate too. Um, but kind of like in a lot of my work, I try and keep it as much as I can. Like I have very like deep blues and slash almost purple in my work. So it kind of like looks almost brown, but kind of not brown. Um, and then like in, in the highlights, I like to push greens into it a lot more. I've been very, very inspired by kind of like film photography and film stocks. And they tend to um, have like greeny blues in the highlights. So I kind of like, yeah, blues and shadows, yeah. greens and highlights. Yeah. I think making like greens, orange, blues really pop, like catches the audience's eye quite uh, quickly as well. No, that's nice. Thanks for that, guys. Um, so we'll move on now to kind of a little bit more technical, but take yourselves back to when you were starting out maybe or earlier on in your careers. Um, what were your experiences of colour grading like? Did you, you know, was there any times where the edit went wrong when a client wasn't happy with the work? You know, could you got any examples of that when you were starting out? Um, yeah, no, I think it was, wasn't even that like early. It was a couple of years back, maybe four, four years ago. I had a, I got a new laptop. Um, they're amazing laptops by the way, but I had a Razer laptop and um, honestly, the screen on it was just completely different to my iPhone. Um, it got to a point where I was literally like, nearly like had to sellotape by my phone next to the monitor to try and match my phone um, color science. But like every time I would render something, it would be completely different on my phone. And personally, that's where I kind of um, posted all of my content. And to be honest, a lot of people consume content on phones these days. So when it was completely different on my laptop to, to then go on my phone, it was just really frustrating. Like the blacks were faded and it was just, it was really bad. But um, yeah, I got to a point where even like when I posted it to clients, they would be like, have you color graded this? Well, after spending like honestly hours on it. And I'd be like, oh, yeah. So um, it is really important to have like obviously color accurate products. Um, and yeah, that's, that's probably my worst experience, kind of just going back and forth for my phone and my laptop. How about you guys, Keenan? Anything similar to that? Um, I definitely edited a video with Night Shift on on my laptop once. <laughs> um, so everything was a lot warmer than it was. So when I exported it and gave it to the client, it was very blue. Um, yeah, um, so that was one time and kind of like my early experiences were pretty bad. Obviously didn't color grade my stuff at the beginning. Um, you just shoot it straight out of camera, just like shooting JPEGs. If you guys shoot JPEGs, shoot RAWs. Um, uh, yeah, so just, <laughs> yeah, and then so you can like obviously learn to like manipulate color and stuff and then you start to like find LUTs and you start slapping them on your footage, but then I'd like crush all the blacks so like you would hardly see anything and then I'd think it was really cool to like fade the blacks as well so it would just be a mush of colors which was not nice. Um, so yeah, just it, it's, it's color grading is still very hard for me. It's still like one of those things that I still work on and I, and I constantly try to like better myself but um, yeah it's definitely an art that I need to like try and get even better at. Yeah. It sounds like we've all been through like the stages of like, I didn't know what colour grading was when I first started yeah, yeah, so and then I went like to town with it but it, everything was oversaturated and not quite right but I think for me was the stage of like learning about colour grading was like you had to go through that journey but what, what made me work out is that what you should be colour grading, you should not, like colours you don't want to colour grade with later down the line, you shouldn't just include in the shot at all. So like editing starts even before you start taking clips into the computer. So did you learn any of that at university, Alice? No, I wasn't, I, I don't even know when I learned that. Yeah. Just trying, yeah. yeah. So well, well at uni. Like you did a colour science course, but that wasn't on the course. Yeah, so. well, on the, on my actual film course, a lot of what we were learning was like theoretical based, but the practical side of things, we were learning about films that were still shot on film stock. And um, obviously colour grading, uh, you know, there were certain ways to do it um, back then, but in a digital sense, they were still like uh, quite, quite new in a, in a weird way. But yeah, I'm trying to think what else I learned. I think it's interesting to know how you guys learnt, how you learnt yeah. that process, was it? How, how, well, how did you, Mike? How did you start learning to color grade? Was it, tri was it trial and error? Like yeah, versus? just like YouTube tutorials, I spent hours on them, like learning on the weekends, yeah, so after school. Self-taught, yeah. Um, 
yeah, I forgot to mention, I did go to uni for visual effects, and they did have a bit of color grading there, but um, I eventually dropped out after six months. But uh, yeah, I, all self-taught um, and trial and error, to be honest. Like, it's, um, again, like I mentioned earlier, you just develop your own unique style over time. You can't force it. People try and rush it. But um, it's just like, yeah, keep on practicing. That's the best way. Same for you, Keenan. Was it, was yeah. it kind of self-taught as well? Yeah, pretty much all self-taught. Um, I definitely like took screenshots and stuff with people's work that I really liked and then tried to like I mimic like it. That. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah, that's, that's, that's definitely a way. You actually bring it in. And yeah, like, you just put it like, side by side and try and do it. But for video editing, like I actually downloaded a plugin from this guy called like John Ellis or something, which actually allows you to create a lot in Lightroom so by using all the sliders, and then you export it, and then you can just slap it onto like your footage. It doesn't look the exact same, but it does the job pretty well. And that kind of like, because I had knowledge in editing photos that way, um, using Lightroom and, and those kind of sliders, um, that kind of like helped as well. So that knowledge on photos, on stills, really directly benefited you working on, on film? A really good way to do it as well is, um, I used to, uh, DJI actually do it now, but every release they do of a product, they release like raw um, kind of demo footage. So back in the day, I think it was for the Canon cameras, they would like post like example of like raw footage and I would download that footage and just practice on that because it's like properly shot, it's like high end cameras. And um, yeah, like DJI do that for quite a couple of drones now. So that's what I used to do as well. I mean, being able to try on, on a, on a real, real piece of footage like that is obviously- And yeah, because you don't have like a, like, it was like reds and like expensive Canon yeah. cameras, which as a 12 year old kid, I couldn't really get my hands on. So. Yeah, it was quite Sorry, good. Alison. I was just going to mention Photoshop, like learning through Photoshop and Lightroom and translating that into video programs really good. Because, like, there's not, there's other ways to color grade. There's like Avid, DaVinci Resolve, Premiere Pro, there's all these programs and they all work to achieve the same kind of look yeah. for you, but all the buttons are different. But Photoshop and like DaVinci Resolve, Resolve are quite similar in the layering kind of thing. So, I guess hand in hand, like, Uniquely, we all do a bit of photography and filmmaking, and they definitely like kind of correlate to each other. Do you think that makes it difficult? There's no kind of industry standard software for that. I mean, everyone probably in the industry uses what Premiere Pro or Final Cut Pro for edits. But what, what do you think about the color grading side? It's um, more good to be able to choose to pro different program, yeah, to like whatever works. Yeah, yeah. I, think I think, like you said, that everything goes hand in hand. Like even mobile phone users, when you're color grading in like the Lightroom mobile app or even just any other app. Like there's going to be things that translate throughout the whole, like from your desktop to your phone. So even if you do start on just like a mobile phone, you're going to have a basic knowledge of like color grading, which you could like transfer over to when you go to like Premiere Pro or DaVinci and stuff. So yeah. if anything, like being a photographer and a filmmaker makes things difficult because the the look I could get out of Lightroom and Photoshop yeah, is not necessarily the look you yeah. get out of video, mostly because like using the kind of cameras we don't get as much of an array of colours as in a film camera as maybe in a, digit in a, in like a photography camera. Could be wrong there, but I've never been able to really push the colours and the details in like a, a photograph compared to um, something shot um, in log or something like that, so. Well, it leads us on, yeah, it leads us on quite nicely uh, to our next topic actually, which is um, what tools um, that, that have helped you um, through this process of, of your career. Um, to perfect your color, color grade and the color grading process. So whether it is software like we've just discussed or um, examples of hardware or even processes when you're out on a shoot, um, yeah, what, what do you think has helped your editing and color grade? Keenan. Um, so DaVinci Resolve has been like one of the key programs that's like changed my color grading experience. Um, you know, I used to use Premiere Pro and there's nothing wrong with that because obviously color is so unique to you and if it works, it works. But um, DaVinci has just allowed me to like open up my knowledge to different tools and stuff like the log wheels, the primaries, and you can, this might not mean anything to some of you guys, but obviously like the, the node base and like having glow and stuff, um, it's, just, it's just one of those things that's just completely changed my perspective on color grading and how much I can actually push footage and push different parts of the footage as well. Because when you're editing video, obviously there's like moving clips and there's, you know, people that you have to track and make sure that the skin tones are good. So... Yeah, DaVinci Resolve is one of the key kind of programs that has changed my color grading experience. So, so do you guys use the, use the same or do you, you guys use something else software-wise? It depends on, like, I use both Premiere and DaVinci, but when only DaVinci when I can really be bothered. 
<laughs> like premiere for client work is enough for me. Yeah. yeah it, to be honest, yeah, I think I've, I'm yeah, still on Premiere Pro. Video. Yeah. 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 There, there are workarounds. I mean, I, I personally edit on Premiere Pro and I edit and I color grade in DaVinci. It it's the yeah. longest thing. Um, but like, obviously, if you really want to make your work look how you want it, then obviously it's worth it at the end of the day. But yeah, DaVinci has been like my software. Yeah, I mean, in terms of hardware, um, obviously all of you guys have worked with ViewSonic on different projects this year. Um, you know, and since using a, a color graded, color accurate, um, and calibrated monitor, has that helped your workflow? Um, what, what, what's changed since you've started using a, a color pro monitor this year? Don't get any confusion from my clients. I don't have to just like sellotape my phone to my yeah. monitor anymore. But, but I, I, I told you about this story earlier, but um, I have a few clients where um, I'm mostly sending like short form social videos to on a, on a, on a monthly basis. And um, towards the start of um, like this early relationship with this client, I was sending, you know, these videos and they just weren't happy. They're happy with everything but the colours. And they're like, Alice, just up the saturation, like make it brighter, like all the words you don't want to hear from a client. And I was like, something must be wrong because it looks good on my screen, it looks good on my phone, it looks good on my partner's screen, my business partner, everyone. And I got to the point where I was then making these amends for him. I was making it brighter, I was making it oversaturated. And one of the videos ended up on a screen in uh, um, one of my local ferries. Um, that sounds really weird, but I have to get a ferry to leave my hometown. So it was on the ferry screen and it was like the most disgusting looking video. It was this like sweet, oversaturated blues and like everything was wrong. So I basically called him up and I was like, tell me the spec of your monitor. Tell me exactly which laptop you're using. And he had this old crappy thing. I don't know what it was. And obviously the, the, the sat saturation was like down to the bottom, no brightness. And he would, that's how he was viewing it. And so that, that was instantly where I was like, if you're going to look at my videos, get, get your Apple Mac open. Because he used that, but it was always closed and just tethered up to his monitor. And that like, basically changed our relationship because he started loving my pieces of work. Yeah. And that was just because he was not calibrating his monitor or, or using <laughs> anything <laughs> appropriate. Just using a managed display, isn't Yeah, I thought it? I was I mean, only, like... For any scramble. creative, it should yeah. be you know, critical to use at least yeah, any, yeah. at some point calibrated. Yeah. That's fine, because like, it's similar. Do uh, uh, you know the project I uh, did for you guys? Yeah. Um, so I did a campaign for ViewSonic with the... Um, Send six series, and we went to Cape Town to film film like a, uh, a project, and um, I was really proud of it. It's probably one of my favourite projects I've done, and uh, I always show my projects to my parents once I've finished, and uh, uh, they were like, "Oh, can we watch it on our TV?" So I quickly checked what it's going to look like on the TV, and honestly, it was just, I, I was I refused to let them watch it on the TV because it was an old TV and it just looked horrible. So I made them watch it on the the monitor. Um, yeah, so yeah, definitely, yeah, so important. But yeah. that, it, it highlights the different output that everyone sees. Um, yeah, sure. And, and, and there's nothing as creative that you can do to control that. Um, yeah. But all you can do is control the creation stage, right? I think, yeah, I think having like, um, I've got the 68 series uh, ViewSonic monitor, and um, having that, it's like 100% uh, of the sRGB spectrum, which is nice because I know that like the colors that I edit with are like an actual like proper standard. They actually look good. I had a previous monitor, um, not from ViewSonic. Um, that it just it just the blacks were like very very contrasty. The colors are very very saturated. And obviously, when you put that onto like a phone or like like an iPhone or a Samsung, it's just going to look completely different. Um, and obviously, the colors are pretty bad as well. I had a few comments on one of my YouTube videos saying that uh, they can't see what's going on, um, which is not very handy because it was a tutorial. Um, so that's just stuff like that, it's just like having, knowing that you have like the, the right amount of brightness and the colours and stuff is very important, especially as you start going into the more professional stages of your life. You're producing better videos for higher profile clients where things have to be right. It's very important that every aspect of the video or the content that you produce is as best as it can be. So it's very, very handy to have. A In terms of the accessories as well, like um, has, how's, the, um, how's the magnetic hood? Is that, has that helped you at all to block out any external light? Yeah, I literally sit, I don't know why I do this, but there's a window behind me oh. on my desk. It's just kind of dumb. Uh, yeah. I have an end light and it, you know, the, uh, we, yeah, it's bad. It's got like, I said it's like the rainbow mode and it's probably the worst idea ever because <laughs> then but like with the hood does actually help a lot um so yeah, i mean there is there. editing in a dark room but like most people will work at home now it's not it's not actually yeah. possible to do that all the time yeah a lot of times i do work off my um macbook pro um and again 
mentioning the Razer laptop again, like going from that to my laptop to then like plugging it, uh, my MacBook into the 76 series, like the MacBook and the 76 series completely match up. So it's so much nicer and I'm confident when I'm sending stuff to clients. And most of my stuff I post is on social, so I know it's going to be looking what um, I meant, like what it's meant to be looking like, what I'm trying to achieve on yeah. the laptop, on my phone as well. I so. think you just want that consistency, don't you? Yeah, you need that peace of mind key. when, you, when yeah. you hit expert. But it's also like, uh, I don't know about anyone in the audience, you guys, but like when I work and I'm sat and I'm in the mood for editing, like I do like my desk to be in a certain way. And since I got my monitor, so the guy sent me like um, a brand new one about a month ago, and you can basically charge your laptop from the monitor, which means that I've got my two um, monitor speakers, the monitor, and then my laptop, and that's the only thing that I have on my desk. And I man managed to get rid of a load of cables. And just like how Mac is beautiful, I think, and it gives you a feeling, I think your monitors do too, because they're quite just good looking, aren't they? And yeah. they're not stuffy, they're quite thin, and the hood actually makes me feel like I'm an actual editor in a suite. It's quite nice, but it's a feeling too. So I don't know if that, yeah, it's all part of it, yeah. Yeah, the USB-C to like charging, is, it's just kind of a smooth workflow. You just plug in, but I have, I have like a laptop dock. Yeah. So just plug in USB-C and then it's work, yeah. Awesome. Well, obviously, glad you guys are happy. Um, also, there's a lot of monitors are back here today. Uh, if you guys want to have a look at the ones um, the guys are talking about, we've got the 76 series on the left-hand side over there. Uh, they are 2K models. Um, the 86 yeah, series on the right, which are 4K. Um, we have an ultra-wide at the back as well, which is a 38-inch uh, curved display. And we do have an unreleased um, portable Color Pro monitor that's not, that's not out yet, um, but there's a little preview on the back, um, which is OLED as well, so a 16-inch OLED. Um, so that's an interesting new product line for us. Um, it's something we'll be looking at and trying to develop like with creatives. Um, there's always ways to improve, but um, that's just the first one um, on that product line. So thanks for that, guys. Um, in terms of during a shoot, is there anything that you look out for um, you know, through the lens that's important to the color grade? Yeah, um, like I can say I use I use the waveform monitor when I'm shooting. Um, that basically makes sure that my footage is not overexposed or underexposed, because um, obviously if things are overexposed, it's very very hard to like dial that back in um, when you're color grading because it's not like raw unless you're shooting raw. Um, so yeah, waveform monitor also like monitors on top of your camera to like make your camera screen a bit bigger. It also helps. Um, exposure is very, very key in kind of making yeah. sure your color is uh, right. Yeah. yeah, like exposure, like the worst thing is shooting overexposed and going back in post. You, you can't do anything really. So yeah, monitors on top of the um, screen. We all shoot so much outdoors, and there's glare on your monitor. Do you want to have like the brightest? Yeah, like the amount of nits on a screen is really important. So when I'm using like the drone um, controller, instead of using my phone, which is still bright, but I use the DJI RSC Pro monitor, which has like, I don't know, like 1500 nits of uh, brightness. So it tells me enough, like, kind of information of, okay, this is actually properly exposed. Obviously, you've got zebra lines you can use and the, the waveform, but it's just little things like that really help, um, especially when it, there's sun glares and everything yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. The main thing that I do is just, if I don't want a color to come out of my film, I just don't let the color go near the set. So, like, if, if we're shooting, like, with a, a talent, a model, or anyone, I want them to have a pre-approved wardrobe. So those colours ideally are probably quite natural and complementary of the wall behind them or anything like that. So like, it's thinking about the grade before you get to the grade. Yeah, is true. The main, yeah, the main small thing things like that, actually, outfits yeah. and lighting. Just no like pink or fluorescent colours, yeah. please. Like. Yeah, and lighting goes yeah. hand in hand with colour grading. Coloured well. lighting, is that, is that difficult? He's well? a bright, they're <laughs> great. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> anyway, yeah, thanks, guys. I mean, that was quite a technical little section, but I hope, um, hope you learnt something from that, and I think it's some great insights um, from everyone there as well. Um, so the next section we're going to look at is a bit more holistic and kind of from your experiences and where you see things going. So how do you see the future for filmmakers um, going forward? Um, you know, that can be from consumption on different devices, more short-form content. Um, where do you see, you know, things are very different now how they were five years ago. So how do you see things changing uh, going forward? Vertical, sad. One word, yeah. <laughs> reels. Yeah, I think in terms of social media, obviously, Instagram Reels is um, slowly taking over uh, Instagram. And um, I think if you do want to obviously grow on social media, you've got to kind of change with what the, what's happening on there. So something like Reels is a massive thing that's kind of changing right now. 
and also how you kind of like shoot for it. I think Keenan's got a really good example. Oh yeah, you're <laughs> viral man. sensation. Wow, yeah. I just posted a reel and it did pretty well. And pretty that's well? I just, I just bumped up the saturation oh, and... Uh, no, wait, wait, how many million? No, I got, I got 18 mil, which is, which is quite cool. Um, so wait, so what was your following before that one reel on your Instagram? 23k. And what was it after that one reel? Uh, 100. So yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, so... so Video, 10 seconds? Like, yeah, so so that, that can literally change, like, yeah. everything. Yeah. And I think that's kind of, like, very important to, like, where, like, especially people sitting in this audience, is, like, where do you want to take your work? Do you want to take it in that social media direction where, like, you have to adapt with the kind of, like, big corporations like Instagram? Like, if they release something, you have to use it if you want to grow. Otherwise, you're just going to be left in the dust. So stuff like increasing saturation because, you know, Instagram is not filled with photographers. It's just filled with people who are just on their phones just scrolling and they need to see something that's like that amazes them from their daily life and they and for example like yeah saturation and going to like new places is is very important if you want that direction like that to be your direction but if you're like doing like commercial stuff and you're and you're still working for the commercial world where you're making like tv ads you can't it's pretty similar everything is kind of like set in stone you kind of have like a relatively similar color palette where things are like dark and it's well lit before you even shoot it um, so that's kind of like the commercial side and also the socials you also now have to think about shooting vertical as well um, for example like the color pro awards video that i did with view sonic um, initially it was made in landscape so that's just obviously for the websites and stuff so you guys can watch it when you're on your laptops but also i have to consider shooting vertical and framing things far enough away so that they can fit into a vertical format so people can view it on their phone so there's a lot more to think about now, especially if you're creating content for like social media. Um, and the main, the kind of main point that I'm trying to say is like just to adapt to the situations that you're given. Um, there's no point like complaining that Instagram isn't like giving photographers what they want. It's like that Instagram is a business, and you kind of have to adapt to that. And if reels are the way that you have to post a photo on as a reel, then it works. And if you get the views, then you get the then it works, yeah. Sad truth. So in that, in that situation you were talking about, that one reel in particular, you, you would have never edited a video like that for a client, say, if it was for like a, no. a campaign or something. Where was the saturation on the like, like, Where was it? Was it? It's also like topless as well, so that's obviously not like a... Wouldn't give that to a client, really. But um, yeah, just, just high saturation, making the sky like kind of pink and the grass like super green. Um, like, yeah. But it's making that person stop on their reels and watch yeah. it for four yeah. seconds, right? You know, if you're just scrolling through just a bunch of like selfies from your friends and then like Instagram promotes this, this like video in, in Bali, a place that you might have never been to or a place that you're very familiar with, and then you just see something that's a bit different, it's like that's kind of like what social media is now. It's like just showing people what's different. Um, the travel stuff and like those travel photos are really cool but it's got to a point where I think a lot of people have seen those really cool scenes and it's like how can you adapt to that situation how can you make something different that people find other value from or people just enjoy watching I think there's like two different like pathways you can go like a teaching education route or you can just create like fun things I think yeah I mean where do you, where do you see it going in the future Alice more do you think you could specifically train as like someone to, to work on reels content or virtual content or do you think you still need to be able to do both i guess yeah everything you guys are saying is so true like the audience retention rate at the moment does not leave time for too much thought of creative processes i don't think you could spend like so long color grading something but then it's gone within a second because it's got to fit within 30 seconds but yeah the industry like i i built a rig um, for my one of my kind of cine cameras, which was for vertical, um, and I've built rigs to suit my body shape and weight tolerance uh, for le for years and stuff like that. And so I basically had to buy a load of different tilter and small rig uh, bits of equipment to basically be able to just flip the camera or not flip it, literally put it vertically and then have like the monitor on the top, which is where the cards usually go, and then, yeah, change it all. And um, I'm actually going to bring, I'm taking that rig um, out to uh, the Dolomites on Monday, which is, I'm going just for one client just to shoot Instagram reels. And so it's an interesting one because I'm, I'm trained 
in a cinematic cinematography way and uh, the feature films I love and, and love to watch are usually really widescreen and, and do you, and do you really find that frustrating like not being able to I actually know, do what you've been trained truth. for and want to do <laughs> I get yeah. very frustrated with it but I understand why because we view our, our all our information for a little sort of vertical brick but um, for me I'm, I'm a camera operator so I've got to go where the job's going to take me so I'm adapting by just making my camera ring more comfortable for me to hold but I do think there's some really interesting things that can happen with reels and your video example which I wish we could put on the screen because <laughs> it's great <laughs> topless Keenan but I, I do think there is um, you know being adaptive um, I always have creative ideas like it's part of the job so there are ways I think vertical um, storytelling could come alive but I think in a hundred years time we'll still be uh, pining for horizontal. Yeah in terms of like um, colour grading outside of social media it's actually really exciting where technology is going though with these cameras. I don't know who saw the recent GoPro release but you can now shoot um, like 16 by 9 but it auto captures like a vertical version without any crop which is like Amazing. a Cheating, yeah, it basically is. It's like lazy filmmaking in a sense, but it kind of takes that stress away of like, oh, I have to now get it in a vertical version. Like, these companies are seeing the change and the shift in the industry. So, um, again, like, I shot um, for Sony on the Air Xperia phone, which is like a, um, an incredible camera just for a phone, but they're now um, pre programmed to have like flat image, uh, image programs within these phones, which when I first started out, like, we had to. Download. I don't know if anyone remembers Magic Lantern on a Canon, but like, like that, that's what we had to do. So um, it's really getting easier for everyone. So there's no real excuse to not like um, get better at color grading, to be honest. Yeah. But it's, it's supported by you. those companies, like you say. Exactly. I yeah. mean, it, it all starts with software and hardware. I mean, we are most of the monitors here today. We can uh, rotate into portrait as well. So you can you can shoot and edit in portrait if you need to see it, things full frame, full size you can do. Um, so it is supported, like you say, with the new cameras, yeah, exactly. new technology. Um, no, definitely. Uh, great. So do you think, do you think um, given the fact videography now is so accessible, do, do clients still need to work with large production houses? Um, or do you think, like say, if, we're, if more companies are doing things solely for reels, do you think there's more opportunities for freelancers uh, like yourselves? Yeah, I, I got this asked this question the other day, actually, at the age of agencies people believe are is crum not crumbling but using freelancers and sole unique creators that have like a look that's under their name like your your company brand is your name isn't it yeah um and why wouldn't a brand come to you if they've seen your instagram and absolutely loved it and been like right we want that but our brand our name on it our logo or our product somewhere in there so I think Instagram is like definitely a loud room for that kind of thing. Yeah, uh, you can pick and choose who you want rather than a, a company, a big company for sure. Yeah. I've got nothing there against agencies at all, to be honest. But like, it, it has got to a stage where I know that agencies just hire out freelancers anyway who could just do the job for them. So it's like they get this big paycheck. Um, it's fair enough, make, make the bread. Uh, <laughs> but you know, yeah, I don't think you need those anymore. Like the freelancers nowadays, we especially in the social media world we're all so connected with each other we all know different people like my guy over there Dean he's, he's my gaffer like yeah, just helps me with my lighting yeah. stuff sorry to call you out but like yeah we, I use Dean he's an amazing um, gaffer yeah yeah it's just you know so many people and you can get the job done in like for a fraction of the cost and a fraction of the time um, so yeah I think social media has allowed that change which is which is really cool and, and very very beneficial for people like freelancers and and young creators like us who aren't in the, haven't been in the industry for for as long I think as well like going back uh, when we first started out like these big production shoots you would look at them and be like and then you would look at what equipment they used and it uh, like thousands of pounds of like equipment yeah, they would use but yeah and now like yeah. honestly you can get a black magic 4k for about a grand which I know it's a lot of money so but in the grand scheme of things it's not in terms of production shoot, but like you could just use that camera and still get to that level of what they were producing. So, yeah. um, what I love about uh, what I do is I meet amazing, like minded people, like I mentioned at the start, who I bring in and we all kind of, we obviously all get paid and then we can make something better all together instead of just doing it on a one man no, kind of band. So, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that leads us on to some concluding comments, I think, for everyone who's come today. Um, it's been a really interesting talk, but I'd be, I'd be interested to know, like, for each of you guys, 
what would be the one piece of advice you'd give to any videographer in this room, photographer, or even if anyone's a, another creative or works in a, in a different space, um, what, what would that piece of advice be? Mine's pretty cliche, um, but honestly, just practice every second you, you can, um, because that's the only way you're going to get better. Like, do free work uh, to get your foot in the door, but obviously don't, don't kind of be taken advantage of, because I have been in the past and it's, uh, it's not good, but like, it's definitely wise to just get your foot in the door of every opportunity you can, because you really never know where it could lead, because, uh, yeah, it's, it's always good just to practice and do that. Alice? Yeah, um, I always give this answer to that question, but I think just keep watching as many films, feature, short, socials, just keep like consuming uh, art, um, go to art galleries. Yeah, I guess you're always learning, right? Just and learning, yeah. but like realizing that, like, you know, not being too intimidating by, intimidated by other people's work and going to the cinema and seeing how a film, like in relation to color, going to see a film, how that director really intended you to see it on the best possible screen possible, which it's not yours at the moment, but it's the, you know, the IMAX screens, you know, not your type of screens, but just going and watching and being a sponge and consuming and, and um, also receiving criticism from people. So that that's the two bits, like view a lot and ask for feedback a lot, pretty much, yeah. Um, my one would be don't be afraid to copy and like take inspiration from other people but just like make sure that if you do do that don't claim it as yours and also just put your own spill in it because that's the best way for me anyway that I've developed my craft is to take other people's videos or photos and see how they've done it try copy it and then see how I can do it better so if I do it by myself the next time things will change and then it will slowly develop into your own style so yeah don't be afraid to copy just um, Make sure you put your own spin on it. Does that mean I can copy your reel? If you want to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got permission there. Lovely. So I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the talk today. Um, the next part of the session will be um, Mike will be doing like a colour grade demo for about 10 minutes over here on our ViewSonic um, Colour Pro monitor. Um, after that, we'll have a Q&A session. Um, so if there's any questions you have from the talk or from Mike's little demo he's about to do, you can ask us then. Um, but Mike's chosen a playlist he wants in the background of his uh, demo, so <laughs> we better get that started. Uh, anyway, the floor's yours, Mike. Okay, cool. Okay, so first up is the black point. I always start with this because whenever you shoot flat, which you should be shooting, it's gonna be very faded up with the shadows. So I'm gonna just push back this um, black point on the shadows a bit and the blacks. So as you can tell, I'm just pushing them down a bit. We don't want to crush them out completely because that's just going to look awful. Um, so at the start, I'm just going to do very basic stuff and then go into a bit more detail. The mid-tones is next. So honestly, it's all about try and error when I'm doing this. I want to just expose the sky a little bit more because the whole entire um, exposure of the shot was a bit dark. And then next up, as I said, as you saw, saw at the beginning, the sky was very like, um, it was popping with color. So I want to use this uh, white point here of the highlights to really make the sky just pop a little bit more. So as you can see in this area here, if I drag that down, it's looking awful, but I want to really make that color pop. So I'm just pushing it to be honest, as high as I can, um, just to kind of bring out the, the exposure and the contrast a bit more. So. Next up is, obviously you've got these red, green, blues. Um, I kind of stay away from, from these, to be honest, but if you do want to push a bit of uh, uh, reds in your, in your mid-tones, you just slightly push this in. I'm going to do a little bit slightly, just ever so slightly, just because, again, I really want to make this like a crazy sunset uh, look. Greens, I'm just going to leave, and blues, I'm going to come back to. Um, but that is literally the basics right now. Um, Right below, we've got the saturation curves. So hue versus sat, I use this dropper tool. And again, I'm gonna keep on mentioning it, the sky is what's gonna be the kind of focal point of this shot. So you kind of select what color you wanna like bring up uh, and it's picked up what it uh, thinks it is. So orange, obviously. So I'm just gonna be pushing this up a bit. And as you can tell, the, the sky is starting to come out with color. The reflection on the uh, sand is popping a bit more and it's coming together a little bit more. And um, when you, if you do want to change these other ones, just make sure you like put a little extra few points in here. Because if, uh, for example, I move this, it's going to mess up all of these other bits. So you don't want that. So I'm just going to adjust it a little bit more. Uh, let's 
lagging a little bit on here for some reason, but I'm just gonna turn on saturation, like Keenan said, just push it up. Okay, so it's, it's getting a bit uh, better now in color, but we're not done yet. So I'm not too sure if I'm liking the color of the sky right now, so I'm gonna go on the hue versus hue. And again, same procedure, you just pinpoint the color point you want, and personal preference at the end of the day, um, you're changing the hue of the sky right now. I just want it a little bit more pink or a bit more red, to be honest. So let me do that. It's all about just fine tuning at the end of the day. Like you can spend hours just color grading, but that's the only way you're gonna get better, so. Um, I normally just do a little bit of adjustments on this one here. So this is the Luma, so it's gonna be how bright you want uh, sections to be. So again, I'm just focused on the sky. It's picked up this a bit, and you can tell if I bump it up, it's, if I put it all the way high, it's been a bit too overexposed. And I wanna really kind of make the sky pop a bit more, so I don't want it too crazy. But again, it's really just about micro adjustments. So I think right now it's not even looking that saturated, so I'm gonna put it a bit more high. And again, like my other type of workflow is applying LUTs. LUTs are amazing as like a base point again, but if you really do wanna learn the basics from the ground up, it's good just to kind of do it from scratch and then you'll learn from there. Um, a quick tip, so to make sure that your blacks and your white points are like um, as dark as they can be or as bright as they can be, and also they have no color, um, I do this trick where I can adjust this. Yeah, it will look like this. So you want to do two points on the corners and you just literally drag that all the way down. And that means like your blacks and your whites have no type of color within them. So they're true to the black and white tone. And also this is really useful when you apply a LUT. Um, LUTs can kind of mess up the blacks and the whites. So it's a really good tip to do that. Uh, saturation, I leave a little bit uh, alone. And uh, next up is the color wheel. So. Again, micro adjustments. I'm just gonna darken up this frame a little bit. Like, I kind of like the, the silhouette. The whole idea of this shot is to get them silhouetted slightly. So again, the sky can pop. So I'm just gonna bring this down a little bit more. And I think, yeah, I'll leave it for now actually. Let's do the mid-tones. And again, I'm gonna bump up the highlights just to make the sky really kind of pop a bit more. You can adjust, um, these to kind of inject some color into it. So if you want a bit of blue, you can see the corner on the right hand uh, side kind of come a bit, become a bit more blue. But to be honest, at the end of the day, this is where, I think this is where your personal stamp kind of uh, gets applied. And um, I kind of like, I like to keep it quite simple. So again, I just kind of want to make this quite saturated and over done to be honest because I think that's what it was it was an amazing sunset so I'm just going to keep that like that mid-tones is going to add a little bit of pink just slightly to make it more dramatic and then highlights um, yeah why not let's just see what it looks like I'm probably going to tone down the oranges in the shadows right now because it just looks a bit too too done but I'll do that in a minute okay next up is the HSL secondary uh, like kind of tool and let me quickly show you. So you use this pin drop and you, I wanna kind of do the sky again. You'll click this and this will select um, the sky or whatever color you want to kind of select. And you just have to kind of like highlight which bits you want adjusted. To be honest, most of the frame right now is orange. So a lot of it's gonna be picked up, but I need to be careful not to kind of mess around with skin colors on Luke's face here and, and mine because It'll look a bit dodgy. It's quite tedious doing this, to be honest. All right, I guess I'll just do that. You get the idea. So this is um, everything you see right now is going to be what's going to be changing when I change the kind of parameters down here. To make it a bit less kind of obvious and just softer, I always apply a little bit of like a feather. They call it blur, but it's, just imagine it as like the feather tool you use. 
So I just blur it slightly so everything blends in quite nicely. And then again, we've got a color wheel here. So for example, if I go to the blues, you can see everything I've just selected is blue. Um, and you can see if I use this, it kind of softens the clouds a bit, but obviously that's looking awful. So we're gonna do a little bit of a different approach in the, uh, again, the oranges and the uh, reds. Okay, so that's gonna be it on here. I'm gonna quickly go up to the basic uh, correction, just to kind of micro adjust again. So contrast, highlights again, just pump, pump it up a bit. Shadows, just crush it a bit because I want that silhouetted look. And just overall whites are gonna be uh, bumped up just to kind of get that overall brightness in the shot. And then blacks, you can see in the corners here, um, it's, it's a little bit uh, faded. So I'm gonna just push the blacks a bit darker so we get a bit more detail in the uh, tire down here. Okay, so as you can see, I think that's the light to be honest. Let me quickly play it. We're getting there, but I think you can see on Luke's and uh, on my face, it's just looking a bit too orange. Maybe, to be honest, it's probably gonna be bouncing um, a bit of light on their face, but I'm gonna quickly just adjust that. So we're gonna nest the clip, go back to the HSL tool. I don't know if this is gonna work, but let's just see. So I've selected his face and I just wanna highlight the skin as much as I can. This might work, it might not work. Yeah, you can kind of see Luke's face. It gets slightly, you don't want it obviously there because we look gray, but you just want it a little bit slightly below the uh, zero point, just so it's a little bit less orange because yeah, otherwise it's just gonna look a bit too orange overall. Um, okay, so next up is, I'm just gonna clean nest it for the ease. We're gonna go to the Lumetri basic correction just toggle this slightly to get a Lumetri color panel up here. And you're gonna select this mask. And again, the sky is everything in this shot. So I'm gonna quickly box up the sky. Uh, let me make this big quick. A key thing is to feather out this box straight away, just cause you're gonna then see that distinct kind of uh, separation once you start editing. So. To be honest, just feather it as much as you can just to kind of make it all blend in together. And then I'm gonna just go back to the curves tool and really just try and bring out the sky. As you can tell, if I'm bringing it down, I'll just do this for an example. Um, it's just really highlighting those um, clouds a bit more in the distance. And I want the sky to pop a bit more. So I'm just gonna adjust like we did before, the mid-tones, the highlights, but you don't wanna go too overexposed. And also, just a little bit. Again, this is gonna be kind of an over the, the top edit, but I like it that way. Bit of pinks. And then we got the problem here again, actually. Let me push this up a bit more. I'm pushing this, uh, Mask just up slightly, because again, I don't want the skin tones to be kind of wrecked. But I think they actually are. <laughs> okay, that'll be fine. If I toggle it on and off, you can see the difference here. Uh, let me zoom in a bit. You can see how it's just adding a, another dimension, a bit of dramatic kind of uh, color. And it just, again, it kind of matches that raw shot uh, we sh I showed you at the start of what it actually looks like. Um, and yeah, to be honest, I could spend hours on this, but let's see if I can get the uh, raw shot. If it works. I don't know why that looks like that. All right, forget it. All right, so that is that is that edit done. For those wanting to know um, how you're gonna have kind of get past this problem of the, the box, 
you can, in fact, um, use these keyframes here to literally individually move the frame or the box. So if I go here to, to this point, for, just for example, you'll see as I play it back, you see that box kind of move. So you can kind of select which sections you want being uh, kind of color corrected in the sky. Um, but yeah, that is that shot done. How am I doing for time, by the way? Okay, sorry I took so long. But yeah, these are, these are the other shots, but yeah, there you go. <laughs> Yeah, thanks to Mike for an unbelievable, like it shows the unbelievable level of detail that goes into every single, every single scene that you see in one of, in one of the films. Um, so yeah, that was fantastic. Um, so yeah, welcome back Keenan and Alice. Um, now yeah, I'd say we have time for maybe two questions. So it's like a first come, first serve. Um, there we go, let's, let's go. Oh, one sec, sorry, we do have a mic as well. I think we can get one. Yeah, just at the front here, Kevin. Cheers. Just at the front here, yeah. Yeah, to be honest, that example, yeah. Completely, yeah. I think um, that example was probably overdone because when we were shooting at Keenan, it was a pretty crazy sunset, right? Yeah, so to be honest, that, in terms of saturation, that example was kind of level 100. But um, again, it really depends on your unique style. Like, you're going to probably overdo it at times, but you'll look back on those previous times when you in the future and you'll be like yeah I kind of overdid it and you'll learn from that so you don't really know at the time you should have a rough idea but you're going to develop those skills but I think have a kind of rough idea of what you want to achieve and just as soon as you like what you see like kind of maybe even like um, just save the project and uh, close the program and then next morning you honestly will look at it differently that's what I always do um, so that might give you a better idea of like if you're happy with the final image to lock it in. So I don't know. What about you guys? Yeah, I agree. Like take a break, probably maybe go outside, like reset your eyes, and like the way your eyes will perceive color will change if you go outside. And the color temperature is different. Come back into the room, and you'll probably see things differently. Maybe show some friends or family, see what they think of the color. If you think it's gone to a place a realm over the point of that you're happy with but you're not sure why maybe yeah ask friends family i would say uh maybe yeah refer back to the raw because you look back at the the yeah. log footage and then you, you obviously see the natural that the how it's completely changed um maybe so this is a bit of a weird one but i often view my whole sequences or films in black and white and then watch it again in color um you can do this with uh, a feature film as well and it's qu make it's quite an interesting way to look at different storytelling and and how it changes your eye um, but whack it in black and white and then you'll realize whoa what is my viewer actually looking at because right on that clip we are looking at the sun the sunset it's beautiful and golden but maybe your intention was for everyone to be focusing on who was on the beach on the bike so yeah. maybe putting it in black and white might make you realize where your eye is being drawn to it so little things like that uh, that's interesting like the use of color is highlighted by the lack of color sometimes like you say so I mean, that's, that's quite a good idea actually yeah. you should yeah and you're real. <laughs> so maybe one more question. Um, if, we, if there are more questions after, um, Mike, Alice and Keenan will be around, so feel free to catch them and ask them then. But we'll have one more uh, for the Q&A, uh, if there is anyone who's got any. Um, you all spoke about how social media plays quite a big part in what you do. And I think for some people, social media can be a weird place because like, you're often comparing your work to other people or you're trying to think in terms of trends. How do you marry what you're actually interested in doing? Obviously, you've all got your own unique niches and you're obviously making money doing what you love, but how do you marry that with like having some kind of strategy to actually build a brand or use social media in a way that actually benefits you rather than makes you feel worse off for having like been in the social media space, I suppose? Yeah, like, be, yeah, be careful who you follow. Only follow like things that will serve you and try not to if you know you're going to be triggered and be comparing yourself to other filmmakers, maybe just don't follow them. I know that sounds a bit harsh, but you, you, consume, like you consume everything uh, that you put in front of your eyes. So like if you don't want to feel negative, then 
just don't don't look at uh, unfollow people. I don't know. Yeah. It's a tough it's a tough question because it, obviously it's it's very hard. Like social media is this weird space where like you are ever like trying to be something else that you might not want to be just so you can grow for example so i think it's very important to maybe like take a step back every now and then like take a step away and actually think about what you really want to do because if you really put your mind to something and you really want to do it you will be able to do it, it just takes a matter of time so if for example you don't want to be following all these trends and doing this stuff but you actually really want to be making like cool fashion videos for brands it's just continue doing that continue posting that stuff and the right clients and the, the right kind of niche will find you and you will actually be able to do it it's just it's just a matter of just having that mindset of saying you know what this like this is, this shouldn't affect me and you just have to just keep pushing in your direction because there's always a need for everything even if it's like fashion videos food videos there's a need for everything um so you you will find your way as long as you just yeah. continue going kind of set a goal strive to be the best in your field and honestly if you work hard you will achieve it like i think um yeah, like it's, it's being persistent and just consistent with it. Um, yeah, it's probably the best thing. Great. I mean, I think we'll have to wrap up the Q&A there. Sorry it's so short, but the guys will be about, so please do ask some questions if you get a chance. Um, so, yeah, it's been a pleasure to host Mike, Alice and Keenan tonight um, and learn all about their creative processes. Like the, the crazy detail that Mike showed us in, the, in that colour grade was pretty amazing. Um, we've touched on the importance of video um, of colour in creative work, um, the tools and methods that can be used um, to improve colour output, as well as what's the, what the future is like for looking, uh, looking for videographers sorry, uh, and, and reels as well, like Keenan showed. Um, so yeah, let's just have a big round of applause for Mike, Alice uh, and Keenan. Um, so yeah, tonight wouldn't, be, wouldn't have been possible um, without the help of the ViewSonic team. So we've got Kevin, I can't really see, it's really bright. Kevin's at the back over there, that's Kevin. Selena as well, who's over there. And Chazel, who's flown all the way from Taiwan to be here. So uh, thank you, Chazel, for that. Uh, we also have our sales representatives, uh, Ricky um, and Adnan at the back. Um, so yeah, they're there to demo our latest Color Pro monitors. So if you've got any questions about the monitors or pricing, availability, um, yeah, go to, go to Ricky and Addy and they'll help you out on that. Um, drinks and canapes will now be served, so make yourself at home. Um, ask us, Mike, Alice, Keenan, any questions you might have um, and yeah, anything about the product like we mentioned. We'll also be drawing a, a winner of the raffle. Uh, you should have got a little raffle ticket when you came through. Um, so it'll be for a, a VP2776 uh, Color Pro monitor. Um, so we'll be drawing that around 9 p.m. So stay along. Um, there's only one prize, so uh, you better hope it's you. Uh, so yeah, so we'll, I'll, be, I'll be announcing that at 9 p.m. Um, but in the meantime, enjoy the drinks, the canapes, um, make yourself at home. And thanks again for coming. And we'll see you yeah. the next one. Thanks, mate. Cheers. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Good.